welcome to the Android Fireside Chat, something we try to do now, what, twice a year, um, where everybody gets to ask random questions and then we go try to figure out what the answer to them is. Ground rules, the only ground rule is if you ask a question along the lines of when is, um, you will be disappointed with the answer. We don't talk about future developments for the most part. Uh, and otherwise, anything is game. Let's have an interesting technical discussion. Uh, let's see, also all of this today is driven by audience questions. Sometimes at the fireside chat, especially at IO, we sort of pre-roll some questions uh, from uh, social media and we did not do that. So we are depending upon you to ask the questions. That's your job. Uh, and I will try to see up in the heights. Um, so if you don't know any offhand, try to think of some quick while the panel introduces themselves. Why don't we start with Tor? All right, so I'm Tor Norby, I'm director of Android Studio. I'm Diane Hackford, and I manage the framework team. I'm Wale Aledi, window manager team. I'm Maddie, I'm an engineer on system UI. Uh, I'm Arash, I'm on play. Uh, I'm Steph, I'm the director for the developer PM, DevRel, and UX team. Hi, I'm Brian Carlstrom from the Android Engineering team. I'm Krish, uh, I'm on play, trust, and safety. I'm Yit, I work on architecture components. And I'm Roman, I work on the toolkit team. And I would like to point out that only Tor and Steph use their title. <laughs> <laughs> we get it, you have a higher title than we do. <laughs> title driven development. So, in addition, so it turns out that Android is a really huge platform with many, many things going on, and there's a really good chance that a question that you ask is gonna surpass anybody uh, on the panel's ability to actually answer it deeply. So we have additional people in the audience up front or maybe spread around in the audience. Um, so we may also include some of them, uh, and we'll see how this goes. So I see that, uh, how many people, I'm gonna count now, how many people are standing at the mic? Exactly zero, but now there's one. Excellent, so we have our first Chet, audience question. There's also a mic at the top. Yeah, I see, I, but there's also zero up there. <laughs> All right. So I wanted to ask not as much a technical question, but uh, we just hit uh, version 10 of Android. And I know a lot of you have been with Android for almost ever, at least. Um, so just kind of what is the, what is sort of the biggest uh, surprise or the thing that, that has been added or, or that it's been used for that, that you didn't expect in the beginning uh, that you're most proud of or excited about? So who was here prior to 1.0 on the panel? All right, a couple of them. You want to start with that? Surprising things. Uh, I mean, nothing's really surprising anymore because Android is kind of everywhere, but I remember the early days where, you know, we're still celebrating like a few thousand phones being sold and people were putting it in like fridges and washing machines and sending them to space. We're like, why are you doing this? Like I wrote some of that code, you really shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, and seeing in ATMs too was a... Uh, oh God. Yes. <laughs> and, and how many people have been on a flight where you try to swipe up from the bottom to see the, the navigation <laughs> buttons? Yeah. You can usually trick it, and then occasionally, like, you can even kill the tack, and then you're like, what, you know, what do I do for the rest of the flight now? I told you to stop doing that. <laughs> Anything else surprising? Um, I'll say there's a couple points I remember. There, there's two, two specific points. There's Because we first shipped the G1, and then I can't remember the name of the other device without, without a keyboard. Um, but we originally, Android was only running on our devices. And then some OEMs started shipping it. And there was a point where the number of other devices besides ours running Android surpassed like our own devices, which for a lot of people in the team was kind of like this really scary, like, oh my gosh, you know, like, what are we doing? It's not our device anymore. And kind of like learning to <laughs> accept that, you know, like we don't have control over what we built so much, you know, and, and it's actually get, and to learn to like, it's really exciting actually seeing all the things these companies do and, you know, seeing them making bigger screens and all the stuff, it's, a, it's just amazing. Um, and there was another point um, seeing some other companies make um, Android devices without the Google services on them, which is also something we very much want Android to be able to do, but seeing that happen is just kind of like, oh my gosh, we made this thing and this is happening and it's like further like, oh, and we don't have, you know, like even less control over what's going on there. But it's really awesome to see it happening. But it's a, yeah, it's a, it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, great. Let's go upstairs. Hi. 
Uh, so disclaimer, I missed the lint chat, so if this was answered there, I apologize in advance. But we, we could do that presentation for you first. Oh, could you real quick? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so when we're doing our CI checks and everything, tests take a long time and lint takes a long time. And these are not done in parallel. Uh, from what I understand, the root cause of this is that lint is not using Gradle's worker API. So I'm going to avoid the when is, but is it possible to make it use that, like, from our own, you know, from our own builds? And uh, if not, is there anything blocking that? There's no word when in there. So I actually missed that talk as well. Uh, <laughs> and I'm having flashback to last year's Dev Summit with questions around Lint and CI performance. Um, yeah, it's something we should look into. Um, in fact, when we demonstrated the new build attribution UI today, I pointed out that, hey, we're listing tasks that are always run. Uh, I didn't highlight that I've written one of those tasks that <laughs> is always run. So uh, it's a bit of shame for me. I know Zav is smiling from the front row. <laughs> Uh, it's something he wants us to work on. So it's something we should get to, uh, but obviously, as Chet mentioned, we're not going to make promises today. But thank yes. you for the feature request. Appreciate it. All right. <laughs> Hi. Wow, looks like you have a whole sheet full of questions. All right. Yeah, I'm sorry. I will ask a question about uh, instrumented test uh, because we have really tried to make it like um, reliable and to get an, an environment that will be reliable enough to uh, do instrumented tests, so we try to do a script to kill the emulator, to restart it at each test, to uh, wait it for to be online, and all that kind of stuff. And we are still failing to get a, real, a reliable environment. So, do you have any advices so we can get there? A viable test environment. Are you talking about like for launch time for test. activities? What's that? For instrumented tests, for UI tests. Mostly. Right. Uh, yeah. I don't know when we have the testing talk is today or tomorrow. Like, we know it is hot. Uh, it's kind of doable. I mean, we do it too. But there is some like longer term planning, but it's like distant future. So you kind of need to deal with Espresso and uh, other libraries people built on top of it for now. It's, it's, right, it's right now is really hard, but there's nothing we can provide. But you can you can always try to the ghetto people just try to minimize their reliance on instrumentation tests. I recommend that. And then you can also try using RoboElectric for some parts of it where you're really not trying to test the UI. But for the testing the UI, you have to run an instrumentation test. Like there's no way around it. I know Espresso has tried to deal with a lot of these things and make things more reliable in general. Yeah, and uh, we have a lot of instrumented tests uh, for the platform and the framework, and the good news is that they're also very flaky for us. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it, anybody from the testing team here that wants to take that and do anything more with it? I'm not seeing any hands. There is dedicated testing office hours. Yep, go ahead, go ahead, that's great. There's a dedicated testing office hours at the summit though, and we'll have the whole test team, the test team here as well, so you can ask them there. So seek them out. Thanks, upstairs. Yeah, thanks. Um, so there's a lot of community momentum building around Kotlin native multi-platform. I'm wondering if the kind of Jetpack team or the um, specifically architecture components team is exploring um, any support in that area? We're watching it very closely. <laughs> no, we, this is like uh, we we want to provide libraries that people want to use, and this becomes like important. This like this is something we are really watching closely, but uh, no plans right now. Uh, we are actually rewriting paging in Kotlin, and that might actually be the first library we ever try this. Uh, so it is important if people want, but we kind of need to see the demand to provide the supply. Steph? Yeah, I, um, I, I do think, I think you might have broken Chet's rule, but that's okay, uh, uh, about asking for features. I, I do think it's worth mentioning that one thing that's really cool about Kotlin Native is one thing that we're often asked about is code sharing across uh, multiple platforms for backend code, for business logic. And it's something developers talk to us about often, like, you know, hey, I have this common set of things that I want to do, I want to do it across, uh, I want a common backend that can provide functions that work across the web. Android, iOS, and you know lots of other clients. And I think one of the things that's really cool about Kotlin Native is that uh, you would be able to write those and then execute them in a single way, and then also potentially have you know a coherent way of approaching it between your client and your server. So I think it's a really interesting area. 
um, you know, we're not answering future questions, but it's a it's cool to hear about. It. And I think if there is, uh, yeah, we are very interested in what the community thinks about it, like we always are. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Hey. So just a quick question. In I think last year I/O, you uh, Project Nitrogen was announced like for making Android testing easy. What happened to that? And are we going to see any improvements in testing dynamic modules, especially around instrumentation <laughs> testing and RoboElectric? Have we mentioned the testing office hours? <laughs> uh, anyone know anything more about nitrogen? I mean, I think they're still working on it. Uh, we don't have studio support uh, ready yet. Yeah, I think generally, uh, I think everything Tor said is true. I think it'd be great to go to the testing office hours. In in general, I think uh, testing is an area we are getting asked a lot about recently. Uh, it's definitely something that we would love to invest in for the long term. It's something that is you know super important. We would love to see people testing more code. It definitely <laughs> helps you write higher quality code. Uh, so you know, obviously, feedback is great. Awesome. There's a lot of future questions in here, Chet. <laughs> yeah, uh, should we repeat the ground rules? There was only one. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes. Hi. A little short. Hello. Um, so in, as individuals, what is your top pet peeve anti-pattern or favorite paradigm that third-party developers have adopted? <laughs> Let me think. <laughs> that was many questions at once. Um. Diane, you want to go first? We're supposed to be opinionated. I have lots though, of right? little things. I mean, uh, using abusing foreground service is a big one that we kind of instigated because we kind you know all the background restrictions and stuff and everything. But um, it's it's becoming an issue, and so we're going to have to do stuff to address that. Um, My personal one is uh, app size. So you know, focusing on APK size, I. I Regularly, for fun, go and just tear down a bunch of third-party apps just to see what's in them and, and what what was left inside of them. It's a very fun exercise. And sometimes you find like two plus megabyte, like multiple uh, t testing images of like pigs on carts or whatever, like random stuff that has no business being in like Yelp or some other app. Um, and uh, I encourage you all to do that and post those on Twitter. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> I, you know, going along with that, a new one we were just looking at is um, uh, compressing your resources um, table because uh, some apps do that to reduce their size, but it ends up meaning that we have to, on the device, decompress it every time we need to access it, which is terrible. So we also need to do something about that. All right, and that's it. And otherwise, all apps are perfect. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So my question is around trust and safety and developer accounts and uh, how like play console postures in relation to the community. Um, I understand that there's this balance between bad actors and trying to make sure that people don't get onto the platform and don't put apps in the ecosystem that are detrimental to the end users. And I think that's something that like everyone here would agree is like something that that needs to that needs to have good like strong institutional support for. Um, but at the same time, people getting their accounts banned when they did nothing wrong is incredibly detrimental to them and could also mean like their company goes under. Um, for example, our app got pulled off of the Play Store, and I don't, I don't care, like we got it reinstated, it's fine. But like, you know, our app got pulled off of the Play Store for having the word Gmail in it because we, you know, sit on top of Gmail. Um, and the, the, the email went to like, like the notification went to some email address that we haven't used in four years or something. <laughs> Uh, there was no information on the play console. No one reached out to us. Like, this is not a sustainable way to do this. And there's been a lot of pain in the community. Um, this was kind of addressed at the keynote, and the thing was like, "Yes, we're sorry. You're going through a hard time, but that doesn't actually give us any like remediation. There's nothing we can do with that. You know, I can't go to my boss and be like, "Yeah, Google said that they know we're having a hard time." <laughs> you know, so. How how's like what's what's the plan for this moving forward so that developers don't have to worry about whether their account is going to exist tomorrow, let alone the app, let alone you know building building apps that people can actually use. Yeah, I, I was going to say you took away two of my talking points, so that's actually good. So you agree philosophically that it's very important for us 
both as developer and the user ecosystem to be able to you know protect our users uh, and and I'm glad that you know the developer community feels that way and we have seen some of that expressed on Reddit and other places so that's actually good and positive. You took away the second talking point which was Tian in the keynote actually talking about trust and safety. And I think one of the things I want to reiterate is that you know 99% of the time when we do enforce on developers uh, it's actually accurate. But at the same time, we want to be very sensitive because the 1% of the time when your app is taken down incorrectly, we are aware like it's actually serious and it has a potential impact to your business and so on. So I think from that perspective, the gravity of what the costs uh, could relate to, I think we can relate to that one. There are three things that we are doing uh, to be able to minimize some of it. I don't think any system is going to be perfect, but we are, we are at least working on a few things. Uh, the first one is the Play Developer Console, and actually we're trying to figure out what's the best way to surface some of these messages in the console uh, and surface them you know, both in context as to you know, when the app is blocked, but also to try to be more prescriptive about, hey, these are the reasons, or maybe these are the things that you got to do. So we're, we're working on it. I know we don't talk about the future stuff, but, but, but this feedback is heard loud and clear, and, and it's one of the things that's top of mind for us as well. Uh, and when we do communicate uh, in email, like we are actually you know, trying to be more prescriptive as well. Um, and I know that's not the perfect answer, but you know, like at any given time when, when the app is caught incorrectly, like there's an appeals process, we have a person on the team, or persons on the team, like real humans, uh, who actually look at the appeals and take action if they find out, like in your case, that the app was taken down incorrectly. So agree on the gravity of it, agree on the importance of it, uh, but also completely acknowledge the feedback that we have to do better. So. Uh, I, I just wanted to add, that was great. Um, I wanted to add that, that um, was it this summer that we had a blog where Samir posted uh, on the Android developers blog where there was a bit more detail about some of the steps that we're taking. It's, if you haven't seen that yet, it's worth reading. Um, but I think the fact that the, the number of times that y'all have had, said, had to say real humans are looking at this like belies the impersonality of a lot of the responses that we get. So I think just like consider that as well. So thank you for your time. No, I mean, the, the reason why the first response is always uh, it looks robotic or, or the reason why we enforce that, hey, there are humans actually looking at this thing is because for uh, its type non-compliance by, by definition because we cannot be very specific when we are taking down let's say 1,000 apps for a specific policy violation, like we cannot be prescriptive or we cannot get very specific. But when you do appeal, I think that's the reason why we have a human and that's why there is a difference between the first and the second communication that you see. Thanks. Upstairs? Uh, fun topic to follow. Um, <laughs> so one of the great things about Android is how OEMs can sort of uh, modify the behavior of the OS and things like that. Um, and one of the terrifying things is that they can do that as well. Um, so one of the things I've noticed of Android is it's going towards sort of a more controlled model, more privacy controls and things like that. I was just wondering if that was also the case with working with OEMs and having a more consistent experience across devices. Did, I, I was going to ask for a qualification of, did, did you get, do you have enough to go for an answer on? Okay, great. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we definitely, there's a balance between letting the OEMs have, uh, you know, the flexibility that they should have to do all the cool things they do, and also um, <laughs> less flexibility and to, not, you know, to make sure that you're shipping high-quality products that don't violate some of our privacy policy, privacy rules, or security rules, and, you know, make the, don't make developers' lives hard. Um, we're always kind of, tr you know, trying to find a balance on that. Um, and we are kind of leaning more into um, having some more control over it. Mainline, the mainline stuff is a, is a good example of, of that, where we're part of the reason for, like, you know, certainly updating pieces of the platform is uh, very beneficial for everyone. Um, but it also is nice because it means that those parts of the platform are their shipping code that we, you know, that came from us. So the OEMs aren't modifying it. Um, so we do see that as something that is going to, going to help that to some degree, but it is difficult because taking away control the, from the OEMs also, you know, is, is, is very difficult. They are, they are doing lots of valuable stuff, and so we either need to, you know, do the same stuff or give them ways to do what, to do, still do what they want to do. 
Yeah, I, I actually completely agree with Diane. But I, just to start with the, the, the problem and, and what you're saying, I do think it's a very significant issue for developers because if you have to build something and then you know, test it and it behaves one way and another way and another way and another way and another way, like that's just a huge tax. And so I think it's really crucial for us to address the problem. At the same time, Diane's also totally right. Like what's so exciting, one of the things that's coolest about Android is you have all these OEMs. There, there's you know, over it's like, you know, hundreds of OEMs innovating independently. And that's just driving the platform forward at this incredible rate. And it's really cool. I, you know, we talk about openness on the platform. It sounds corny, but it's really true. That openness means you have this amazing flow of ideas happening. But you know, I'll give you an example of something that a developer talked to me about was, um, did you know the color white is implemented differently among two different OEMs? I'm not going to call out who did this. Um, I'm going to make them feel bad. But, uh, but uh, you know, things like that for a developer to have to like test that, it's just, that's just cost for you. And so I think, uh, Diane, it, uh, obviously we've been talking about this in the team, and something like uh, Jetpack, what Jetpack is doing with Camera X, I think is a fantastic example. I'm, I'm really excited that's going to beta, because there with Camera X, you have an example of something that was very problematic, and now that team has been working a lot with OEM, so now you can write uh, against the camera in a single unified way and trust that it's gonna work consistently. So doing that at the API layer, and then Diane's exactly right. Something like Mainline, again, where we're working with OEMs, is a fantastic way of creating consistency. It's, it's really something that we care a lot about and very empathetic with the developer problem there. No worries, thank you. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, my question revolves mainly technical about UI. Um, so I will start with too much good is sometimes bad. Um, we've been dealing with the keyboard height issue for a long time now. <laughs> that <laughs> it's been really pain for us. <laughs> um, is there a way that we can get an easy way of keyboard height? If not, because there is so much keyboards floating around in every OEM has, every carrier has their own keyboards. Uh, is there a way to at least enforce a system default keyboard for our apps because our app is re uh, heavily relies on the keyboard height to allow um, shifting the um, UI or uh, graphics around the keyboards. Sorry, we just smiled, not because it's a funny issue, but because it came up a year ago and we thought, you know what, someone's going to ask about keyboards. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's a problem we agree with and um, we definitely recognize the, the issue and it's something we're working towards fixing. Turns out it's a hard problem. Like, that's not just like, yeah, we, we're looking into it. No, 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 it's a hard problem that we're It's a hard problem. On. The ecosystem has evolved, and um, for each of those evolutions, right, intentional or in, unintentional, right, or, you know, um, breaking things um, is not good for people that are already depending on it. So we need to kind of make um, pretty interesting choices, right, to make things work better long term. Right. Uh, but at least there can be a way to um, say that my app will always use system default keyboard no matter what. Is maybe something like that? Or, I don't know. <laughs> That's an idea, right? <laughs> um, with, with, with every idea, right, there's, you know, trade-offs and implications, right? And we could probably have a long talk over, you know, coffee or beer, you know, about <laughs> the implications of that idea. Okay, sounds good. But we are looking forward for it, definitely. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, so this is a tools question. Um, I'm a big fan of the IntelliJ Suite. I've been using it basically since it first came out like decades ago. Um, and I love that Android Studio use is, is based on this. It's the best thing you've done, almost. Thanks for your question. Um, <laughs> now, So far, we agree. Yes. So the problem is that I, uh, I, I, I work in other platforms as well, uh, especially web, and I see people there adopting editors that are lightweight, very lightweight. They can actually run them on very <coughs> less powerful machines. And uh, as much as I love the IntelliJ Suite and Android Studio and all of those things, this is a problem that I see, especially for new developers who have less powerful laptops working with. And I think that it's going to become a bigger problem. And what do you have to say about Android Studio becoming too heavy? And I mean, are you thinking that laptops are going to become less powerful, or that <laughs> studios can become more heavy? Um, kind of both. <laughs> kind of like people will be using Chromebooks and stuff like that, very lightweight laptops to do coding. And they, they, they work for web development today, but they don't work for Android. And I think that might be actually be an issue in the future. Yeah, I mean, Compose is kind of web-like, isn't it? 
in, in that, in that, <laughs> in, in the sense that it's like, hey, just edit your source file. You don't need no debugger. Uh, what? Right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so you're Tor, sitting in Tor is on a Tor is a director now. Session. He doesn't understand tech anymore. <laughs> No, uh, so we actually put a lot of work into making Studio smaller. So that was Project Marble, and we haven't stopped that. And simultaneously, JetBrains seems to also be doing their own Project Marble-like thing. So in the latest uh, 2019.3, they've deliberately actually worked on startup time. So they seem to really care about this. Uh, I know that's not exactly what you asked for. Uh, if you're asking for like a, a web-based IDE, I, you know, I have nothing to announce at this time. <laughs> Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Hi. Um, before I say my question, I would like to thank Google for inviting me. Um, I'm, I'm a 15-year-old Android developer, so to get opportunities like this is very, very, I don't know, very rare for me. Welcome to the community. And, and, I, also, and I also like how Google's promoting um, young, young students and other um, university students um, to become Android developers, because I really think it's a good opportunity for them. Cool. Welcome. Um, so here's, here's my question. Last year at I.O., I won't mention who, but um, I was, you know, I was considering it, but um, when, um, this was when uh, view model and live data and other architecture components were under rapid development. Okay, you found out. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what did you say? But basically, basically he said that it was okay to use um, these beta libraries in production. Um, my, qu my obvious uh, question is, is this still true? And for newer um, libraries like Compose, Camera X, um, and, and other Jetpack libraries, um, should we consider using them, or are they just mere ideas that we should consider for the future? So it, it depends. The official answer is never use like beta libraries on production. Uh, yeah, but like, so the thing is, if you catch me in a bar or like talking here, I will say yes. <laughs> Uh, the, <laughs> the, uh, it's like, the, the, the thing is, like, we, we are tracking these numbers and we know like every library, like thousands of apps starts using it on production and we know these numbers, how many sources they have, like before we make something stable and that's the confidence we have. If, if no one ever tries to use these libraries before they are shipped, we will never get the feedback and you will go back to the old days, like two, three years ago where you would always wait a point one version of support library before start using it. We don't want to be there anymore. Like we want people to be able to use the stable version. For that, we need some people to try the alpha beta libraries. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so we need that help. If someone does it for us, it's very lovely. But if you don't want that, and like we know many companies don't, and we're also trying to accommodate for that. Like especially if something is new, it will have a long alpha beta period. But after something stabilizes, we are trying to shorten the timelines further and further so that we can get like fewer features but quicker and more stable versions. And you probably want to make a distinction between alpha and beta, and especially pre-alpha, which I believe composes at actually, this point. Yeah, I can cover, yeah, that's true. Like composes pre-alpha, it's like dev, we call it. Uh, and for, for Android X libraries, when we call something alpha, it is, it is not that it's unstable, it's that API is unstable. We don't even know what we are doing. So, <laughs> <laughs> so things may change a lot. Uh, but uh, like we have seen like there, there's thousands of apps ship with Room before it even become beta. Like, and people use them production. So that might be okay. When we say beta, it means the API is stable, so you won't need to change your code. And when we go RC, that means we don't have any more bugs, that we're just like waiting for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> bugs that we know about. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. And if nothing comes, it's going to become stable. If another bug comes, it's going to be RC2. And another two weeks. <laughs> I think that I think there's also something new that we're seeing with Jetpack, which is while we're shipping a static library, you have the ability to test that in your app. You are shipping that code with your app. If you test it completely, you're happy with the stability of things and the functionality that you get from it, then it is your decision whether to ship with that. 
right? The API may not be stable, but if it solves the problems that you needed to solve and you have not detected bugs in your thorough testing suite that you run all the time, <laughs> then you can make the proper decision, right? It's a little different than writing to something that's, you know, alpha in the platform and we may change the bits out from under you between previews. Yeah, my favorite example of you know what app developers actually do was uh, I think constraint layout. Nicola was telling me that when he reached the first beta, it was installed on a billion devices. Uh, so you know, <laughs> thank you for. <laughs> <laughs> You're crazy. Uh, thank you very much for answering my question. And uh, sorry, Yeet. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Uh, regarding the uh, whole layout measure system of view, like Ramon said earlier in a talk today, view.java is very scary. Um, if you were to start over. I didn't say scary, I said it's long. It is long. <laughs> so you have no problem just kind of control owing through the whole file? All good? Okay, well, for the rest of us, if, if you were to start over, um, what would you do differently, if anything, about the layout and measure system, whether conceptually or in implementation? Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we are doing it differently with Compose. Um, honestly, that's not my biggest problem with our view system or even the framework. There's one change I would make, and I'm sorry, Diane. Uh, it's the activity extends context. <laughs> yeah. I would change that too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, who would change that? Okay, well, all your memory leaks are because of that, so you should all be raising your hands. Yeah, I always find those questions hard to answer because I, I feel like, you know, at the time it was done, you know, if we were to do it different, it's a totally different world now. You know, I remember back when we did the view hierarchy, we actually had a more sophisticated layout system where we, we passed in um, more constraints about, like, minimum preferred maximum size, so you could do a lot more, a lot smarter stuff, and we dropped it because it was too expensive for the devices that, at that time. So, you know, you, you're always doing the stuff under, under the constraints you have at the time that drive a lot of the decisions. Um, and you know, at the time we had like you know one engineer working on it and very low end devices, and so a lot of the design decisions there were driven by that. And these days, you know, Jetpack Compose is like kind of the, you know, how we would do it now, um, but it's a very different world now. So yeah, and there's only one thing that uh, bothers me with the measure layout system that we have in the existing toolkit is the wrap content and match parents. Uh, you can be in situations where it, it, it's, there's a conflict. So if the parent says that it wants to write the content, but all the children say well, they want to match the parent, what do we do? Uh, and you've seen that happen. You know, it does something. It's rarely what you want, <laughs> but it does something. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Uh, so uh, first of all, thank you for the whole modern uh, Android development initiative. Uh, I think it's a great idea. And I wanted to learn a little bit more about how it's going to be Implemented? Is it just going to be tutorials? Is it going to be something integrated into Studio, like Lint or suggested uh, refactoring? Should we use single activity uh, applications? Are fragments going away? Compose animations? What? So, uh, <laughs> what? how is that going to be better educated to, especially to new developers? You answered your own question. Uh huh. <laughs> I heard about 17 questions in there. Uh, modern Android developments? All of the above. I mean, it's a, it's a bunch of libraries that you know, started with Arch components. There's obviously th uh, things like uh, Compose. We have Kotlin on the programming language side. We're doing more tutorials. Uh, we're trying more interactive tutorials. We're doing more samples. Uh, it's, it, it can't be one thing, right? It has to be more than that. Um, so, Steph? Anything I missed? <laughs> sure, I think um, Dave actually said it pretty well. I think the, the reason the team came up with the term modern Android was so we were getting asked the question so often, like what does the Android team recommend? What does the team at Android team recommend? And uh, how many people remember Diane's post where she said we don't remember, we don't recommend anything? <laughs> okay, yeah, it's really cool. Uh, and, and after that, you all like 87 comments and you were like, you need to recommend something. We went back and Diane and I were talking like, maybe we should recommend something. <laughs> And you know, uh, over the years, we've been investing in all of these different pieces, which are, in essence, our recommendation. Um, and what we realized was that the community wanted us to, you know, be more explicit and say, like, you know, look, we really recommend you use Jetpack if you're doing a set of using a set of APIs. Like, this is a really great, effective, easy, quick way to do it. And so I think um, uh, this is, we're not answering futures questions, so I can't say like, you know, the future in the future. In 12 months, you'll see modern Android will have X, Y, and Z. But I think what you're seeing today is a good indication. Um, like, 
of, of how we're thinking about it. The, the goal is to say, like, look, Android is an open platform, and that's super cool. There are so many new ideas, and modern Android is going to evolve. Whatever it is today, I'm sure it will be different in 12 months because someone's going to have a new idea, and we're going to get together and be like, did you see that? That was really cool. Um, and a lot of people are adopting, and we should talk about that. Uh, there's been even some great ideas today. But uh, I, think, I think what you've seen today is a, a good starting point, I hope. Uh, so great thing, the great thing about modern Android development is that we won't hear you ask what do you recommend, instead we will hear you say that you disagree with what we recommend, so. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, hi. Hi, um, so I have a question. I heard you know, a lot of presentations talking about how Google was going, you know, kind of, or at least Android's you know, recommending Kotlin first. Um, I got like 20 different text messages right after that uh, telling me to ask, What's going to happen with Java support? Are there going to be, you know, Java 9, Java 11, you know, kind of syntactical, you know, expansions and support and all of that? So that's kind of like the main question that I've been asked to ask you. Well, well thank you for that. Um, so obviously Kotlin is what we're recommending now, but we obviously, that's building on top of our Java uh, language infrastructure. And so we continue to invest in that, particularly in the art runtime, improving performance for both Kotlin and Java language programs. Um, one of the biggest investments we're trying to make there is part of this project mainline effort, um, as we talked about last year at I.O., is trying to make that, that the runtime itself will be updatable so we can continue to bring new things forward, um, both to support uh, Java language developers and on the uh, Kotlin side. Um, similarly, we also invest a lot on the C++ side with the NDK. Um, we recently announced we're doing like now doing long-term support releases because we, we got feedback from developers that they really like to adopt new versions, but sometimes when they just want a bug fix, they don't want to have to upgrade everything to the latest version of C++. So we do continue to invest um, sort of across the board in sort of our programming language uh, support. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Just to add, when we adopted Kotlin, it was always super clear to us that what we were doing was adding a language, not shifting resources away from other ones. And I think our biggest... Uh, thing we want to be clear about with Kotlin is even as we lean into it in our APIs, we are continuing to invest just as much, if not more, in the Java programming language. Uh, Java was the first language I used. It has a huge community. It's, uh, it's a really wonderfully productive language. And I think one of the advantages of Kotlin is it's interoperable. We expect to see Java, the Java programming language continue to flourish, and we're investing in that. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, last year, I've asked about Bazel. You made Bazel, so it's there. Uh, but. But the rules Android are delayed, rules Kotlin are delayed. Uh, D8 is not supported, which is like four years old. Um, what, what part of the developer tools team works on Bazel for Android? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't work on that. So we, we have a team that works for uh, internal Blaze support, but we don't work on Bazel at all. What I've heard was that the part of the team that worked on IntelliJ slash Android Studio support joined that team, your team. So that's the Blaze support, not the Bazel support. Spelled differently. So we uh, have That's just a symlink, wait, wait, wait. They're, sure, they're similar, but the point is that we have a team that works on supporting the internal Google 3 build system called Blaze. Um, that's slightly different from Bazel, and so it's not something we ship externally. Uh, mm -hmm. And, right. they're, they're, you know, if you saw um, some of the stuff we've shown today, we're working on, you know, all these tools related to the build system, such as the build attribution. This is all investing in Gradle. It's really hard to support multiple build systems. So we don't really want to uh, divert our resources there. We already have lots and lots of requests for, the, for our Gradle support. Uh, so we want to make sure that we at least fund that properly before we start trying to do multiple things. Interesting. Thanks. This is the awkward part where I say, actually, we only have a minute left, so we're going to take one last question. I'm going to go upstairs. I'm sorry for the people that didn't get to ask a question. You wouldn't have liked mine anyway. <laughs> Hi. Uh, you just mentioned you were working with uh, different OEMs to improve like, the, the, usage of, the usage of cameras with CameraX, which is uh, really promising. But I think, um, and I really want to know if there's something that you're doing related with Bluetooth, because my team will have a lot of problems with the as tablet connection and something like that. I missed part of that question. I don't know if anybody caught it, like the last third. Yeah, well, I just wanted to know if, the, if you're working on something like similar to Camera X, but with Bluetooth. Bluetooth. Yeah, so something like Bluetooth X. <laughs> uh, that would be a when question. Uh, I didn't say when. <laughs> <laughs> but now you did. Uh, I, I think that's not something that we could comment on. 
Um, so I'm going to end with that very disappointing okay. note. Uh, <laughs> thanks for coming. <laughs>